Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Elizabeth Ferrer. I am Chief Curator at BRIC, and I'm really happy to, that you're all here this evening. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the Latinx Abstract Exhibition, and we have a wonderful panel, uh, Arlene Davila in conversation with Glendalise Medina, Mary Valverde, and Sarah, and Sarah Zapata. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am currently in Western Massachusetts on Mohican and Muncie land. And one other introductory note, um, we have closed captioning, which you can access by going to the CC icon at the bottom of your screen and just clicking that and you can turn it on or off as whatever you like. Um, I'll say that the captions are not 100% accurate, but uh, we do like to use them because uh, they really demonstrate BRIC's commitment to making our programs accessible to a broader audience. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, now introduce uh, our uh, panel uh, so that we can begin hearing from the artists. Um, and please feel free to leave questions and answers, uh, questions uh, in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And we'll be addressing those questions uh, towards the end of the program. So first of all, Arlene Davila is Professor of Anthropology and American Studies at New York University. Her research spans urban ethnography, the political economy of culture and media, consumption, immigration, and inequality in race. She is founding director of the Latinx Project at NYU and author of the much talked about book, which you see the cover here, Latinx Art, Artists, Markets, and Politics, which is both a valuable introduction to Latinx art, as well as a call to decolonize art world practices that erase and whitewash Latinx artists. Glendalise Medina, who was one of the artists ex exhibiting in the exhibition is an Afro-Caribbean, New Rican interdisciplinary artist who was born in Puerto Rico and raised in the Bronx. Medina has presented artwork at such notable venues as Participant, Artist Space, the Museo del Barrio, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, to name just a few. She is a recipient of the Paula Krasner Foundation Award, the Jerome Hill Foundation Fellowship, and the Rome Prize. Glenda Lee teaches in the MFA program at the School of Visual Arts. Mary Valverde, who is exhibiting a site-specific installation in Latinx Abstract, is a Queens-based interdisciplinary artist who traces her family roots to Ecuador and who has exhibited extensively, including at Smack Mellon, El Museo del Barrio, the New Jersey State Museum, and the Queens Museum of Art, among many others. She is a, she is a commissioner on the board of the city's Public Design Commission and is assistant professor at Hunter College. Sarah Zapata, who is exhibiting sculpture in the exhibition, is a Peruvian American artist who was born in Texas and is based in Brooklyn. Zapata has had solo exhibitions at Delhi Gallery, the Museum of Art and Design, the, Muse the New Museum in El Museo, all in New York, and at Museo Mate in Lima, Peru. She has taken part in group exhibitions and has performed at such institutions as MoMA PS1, the Knockdown Center, and the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art. Sarah is a recipient of the very competitive Queer Art Mentorship. So um, with that, we're, what we're going to do next is look at a brief uh, video introduction of the exhibition, and then I'm going to turn it over to Arlene to begin the panel discussion. Thank you all very much. I mean, it's amazing the lighting in here. <laughs> it's very different than my studio. I like this sort of nice hanging here. The, the speaker in itself is a sculpture. It has a presence of its own where when you see it, you know something is going to come out of it. Latinx Abstract highlights the work of 10 artists working with various approaches to abstraction, a vital but overlooked aspect of Latinx artistic production. In presenting this cross-generational survey of 10 artists, the exhibition challenges the established narrative of abstract art in the United States, one that has long privileged certain voices over others and that has essentially excluded the contributions of Latinx artists. The reason specifically that we use Latinx in the title, it's a gender neutral term. And so it's more encompassing of people that don't define themselves by a certain kind of gender or binary. For me, it sort of puts that positive stamp on who we are. And it's a term that, you know, it came from our community. 
And so I see it as forward looking and I see it as a term that is important because even though it represents a diversity of people, you know, we come from many countries, what we do have in common is that our histories and culture have been erased. And for me, Latinx is a very assertive term that aims to insert our history, our ideas, our values into the American landscape in the same way that I want to insert Latinx abstract art into the narrative on American abstraction more broadly. Elizabeth. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I speak from the ancestral homelands of the Lenape and asserting the long-standing significance of these lands for Lenape nations past and present. I also want to thank Elizabeth for organizing this history-making exhibition that squarely states that abstraction is a common resource for Latinx artists and has been for decades. Why this history is not known and why there's been so few exhibitions exploring abstraction is exactly what this exhibition brings up to full view. In her exhibition catalog, Elizabeth states that this has a lot to do with the racial politics of abstraction as a genre that, is that ties its origins and best representation to European and Anglo-American artists. Think here of the white male painter tradition that has been promoted by MoMA forever. Now today we're living through a great moment to be breaking the stereotypes, given the number of new exhibitions on abstract art now on view. Just in Puerto Rico this week, the first major retrospective of abstraction opened up in the Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico, and it included many New Yorkers and artists in the diaspora, as well as the exhibition XX at Latchi Gallery that also opens this next week, I believe, focusing on Latinas working in abstraction. The racial politics around abstractions have been well rehearsed in relation to African-American art, where generations of scholars have debated abstraction in relation to what is black art and how it should look like. In this regard, many have questioned abstraction's political stakes, while others have praised its freedom from representational, the representational risks of evoking positive or negative stereotypes or representations. In fact, in a context where black and brown bodies are increasingly coveted in a contemporary art market dominated by primarily white collectors, we can understand why some artists of color may purposefully choose abstraction to avoid their fetishization and commodification. And thank you, um, Glenda Lees, for warning me that my paper is covering my camera. I apologize for that. Um, yet one key lesson from the history of African-American artists and abstraction is the importance of claiming space in all types of exhibitions as a way of transforming and troubling dominant representations of African-American and Black art and how it should look like. And which is what exactly this exhibition also does for Latinx artists. I discuss how the narrowing view of abstraction affects Latinx artists in my book, Latinx Art, where I document the many irritating questions artists must face whenever they work in abstraction. Some felt pressure to move away from figurative work to abstraction, which they felt was favored by their MFA programs and mentors as qualitative better. Um, um, whereas um, others experienced pushback against doing abstract work because they were either accused of wanting to wash what their, why wash their work, or, or face blatant and subtle biases favoring work that could be seen as Latinx around the expectation that brown and black artists painting black and brown, black and brown figures would be more commercially viable. Many also bemoan the art market's limiting pressure to decide between branding themselves as either figurative or abstract artists, as if these were very strict and irreversible choices. On and on, abstraction was seen as a highly contested terrain loaded with meanings and issues beyond artist control or their intentions. All of this made abstract art extremely political because to do abstract art often involved battles to assert the right to produce work free of imposed expectations, constraints, 
or assumptions. In all, debates around abstraction are as limitless as are its manifestations, but the message that Latinx abstract makes clear is simple and overdue. Like most contemporary artists, Latinx artists work in different genres and topics, and it is due time to make room for thinking about abstraction and challenge strict oppositions to some equally static conception of realist art. Most of all, it's time that we ch challenge this expectation that we must see identity in the work of Latinx artists. The artists in this exhibition have created powerful works that help us do just that that help us to appreciate abstraction in artisanal processes, in materials, um, or even a DJ sound mix. And that point us to see and appreciate abstraction as a resource that is readily available for invention and self-making. There were varied stories and histories spanning indigeneity, hip hop culture, urban everyday life, and challenge the minimalist ideas that we tend to associate with abstraction while helping to unearth marginalized identities, narratives, and histories, as well as, as the scope and look of contemporary art. So I look forward to hearing about each of these artists. Each of them will share for about five minutes about their own process, um, after which we're gonna have a Q&A uh, among ourselves, and then we'll open it up. And I really encourage everyone to please um, send us questions. We'll be looking at them while artists speak and selecting those to start the conversation. And with that, I leave you with Glenda Lees, who's going to start the conversation. Thank you. So hi, my name is Glenda Lees, and I want to thank Arlene and Elizabeth and Brick and all the staff and all the supporters that made this evening possible. Um, first slide. So one of the main interests in my practice is how do humans learn? What is the role of patterns? and how do, what role do they play in creating our reality and our identity. So I deconstruct and reconstruct images and language in order to recontextualize them with the aim to establish cultural equity. So what you see before you is called black gold and is the foundation for my visual language. It's comprised of 50 basic shapes taken from the face of a boombox and rearranged to convey that item, but also in orientation that relates to portraiture mainly because I consider these shapes to be my signature tag or my style of writing. Next slide. So in 2016, I began to research Taino pictographs and symbols to incorporate them into a pictorial language. What you see before you is a relief print that holds motifs and symbols I collected in my research. If you hear honking, I'm just in East Harlem, you know, it's just loud. Um, so if the 50 shapes in black gold are my alphabet, I was thinking now it's time to make words and those words make uh, sentences and create a kind of syntax to this pictorial language. Next slide. So now that I have a language, what am I gonna say, right? So I became interested in the hero's journey in relationship to Taino folklore. And I started to create color studies that I see as character studies which you see on the right of this image. So there's two character studies and there's two relief sculptures on the, on the, on the, on the left. Um, next slide. In my research, I came across this story that the Taino Indians believed that the first witness of life was the owl. And what you see before you is my owl, my rendition of an owl. So joining the two shapes in my alphabet, so joining two shapes in black gold, I double those two shapes to create wings and I then marked the Taino symbol for the owl and placed pre-Columbian motifs on the facade of the piece. The piece is made of oil pastel, spray paint, marker, and nails and thread on wood. Next slide. This is my son, which was made to signify the life in that story and the dawn of a new day. So in this piece, I also placed the symbol of the sun on this facade and a pre-Columbian motif I came across in Matilde and Matilde uh, Perez de Silva's book, Industrial Applications of Indigenous Decorative Designs in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. This is a book I use constantly in my practice. And it's one of the, the basic things of my, uh, the basic sources of my research. Next slide. This is a detail of the owl. So these pieces are made to convey a multi-level transformative existence. 
meaning that the relief is uh, multiple level, multiple levels of a relief. Uh, the colors are very specific and relate to the colonization of Puerto Rico and the hybrid identity of the hybrid identity of Puerto Ricans. Next slide. This is the detail of the sun. In it, I use wire instead of thread so that the shine from the metal enhances the experience of the viewer in relationship to the piece, like the sun. The use of nails in my work is an homage to my uncle's craft work, which I grew up admiring my whole life. And to level the playing field of abstraction, what's considered to be high art and what's considered to be low art craft. So this is the end of my slide presentation. I wanna thank you so much for your time and attention. And I wanna introduce you to Mary Valverde. Before we start, uh, can production ensure that the videos and the slides are visible? I, I understand some people in the audience are unable to see the slides. So if production can ensure that the slides are visible, please. All right, Mary, uh, apparently the problem has been fixed. You can okay. go on, thanks. Um, I am now unable to see images. Great, now I can see everything. Uh, thank you everyone for coming um, and joining us via the virtual platform to see this exhibition that I am really proud to be a part of. Um, my name is Mary Van Verde. Um, and uh, I just wanted to speak quickly about the work that's in the show. It's titled Placa, and it is um, inspired by ornate geometric pre-Columbian design. Uh, the in installation is a large scale mixed media wall grid um, of modular geometric forms. Um, and it is made with um, the, the palette and patterns that I found in my research of Incan textiles and documentation of motifs inside Huaca structures. Um, the work aims to function as a material object that marks past and future points of cultural intersection, exchange and reflection between First Nation American Indian people, indigenous Latinx people and their collective historic legacies and present day life. The installation proposes a temporary landmark that illustrates coordinates of overlapping space and time offering a conceptual access point of cultural and ancestral symbiosis. Um, so the work itself is um, mixed media. And um, as I said before, I centered my work and research um, as a visual artist on the historic and present day connections between indigenous as well as African communities in the Americas, um, the effects um, of forced migration, exploitation, genocide, slavery, um, and as well as ongoing evolution, adjustment, and invention and shifts of culture, visual arts, and language. Uh, we keep modifying and adjusting our visual culture to maintain and acknowledge our indigenous and African roots through the abstraction of traditional systems, codes, and use of patterns um, the embedded mathematics, geometry, and scientific language is important in the rhythm of our textiles and our speech, organizing our spaces. I'm fascinated with the infinite arrangements of these patterns and visual art, uh, visual um, uh, functions. And I'm interested in contemporary science, their investments in the abstract and theoretical function of time and space. Um, also the connection uh, to astronomy, the cosmos, abstract geometry, mathematics, and um, pre-colonial pre um, objects and uh, material culture. Um, so in this piece, I was uh, really, next image. Um, those are, this is a different vantage point of the material and installation. Um, the top image is inspired by uh, specifically by the te textile um, motifs of pre-Columbian and Incan textiles. Um, a lot of the um, 
textiles in Andean culture were said to be worth mo more um, than gold because of the labor that it took to create. So um, in my research in terms of palette and color and the power and vibrations of those materials um, and uh, the basic visual vernacular that it, it has in the culture is what inspired um, the, the color and the palette, but also within that um, organized uh, geometry is the Chakana symbol, which is a symbol for the divine. Um, and the floor, next image. The floor piece is inspired by um, a, a pattern motif for, of the huaca of uh, la luna, which is a huaca of the sun, um, which is a divine space and um, a space of contemplation. And so the patterns that are organized on the floor are based on a sequence of patterns that were found in the Huaca of the Luna. And um, it is, I wanted to um, address the, uh, the issue of architecture and heights um, and organized spaces, uh, patterns that were used in organized spaces um, using black and gold as the palette color for this. Um, and in both, next, next image, in um, most of my installations, not just this project that was able to um, create for the exhibition, most of my installations are meant to expand and contrast depending on space. So um, next image. Um, even though the work is very, is supposed to be ephemeral and it's supposed to be movable um, and expansive, um, I expect it in the next iteration of um, an installation to look slightly different, either expand larger depending on the space or collapse um, or um, be reinstalled in a different um, organization. Thank you. And with that, I will um, um, share it and next to Sarah. Thank you so much um, to the other artists and um, all of the artists included in the exhibition and Elizabeth and Arlene and the entire BRIC team. Um, my name is Sarah Zapata and um, I'm gonna talk you through some of the pieces um, of mine in the show. Um, so I have a uh, two contrasting um, pieces that are on exhibit um, and some of them are sort of older work um, as well as some that's brand new that was created after the pandemic. Um, so the two sculptures I'm gonna talk about first are from 2017. Um, they were originally from an installation. If we go to the next slide. Um, so I'm interested in how textiles can create these installations and rather than textiles adorning the body, they adorn space and then are direct bodies of the viewers coming into the space. Um, so uh, previously to the pandemic, a lot of the work was able to be touched and was the sort of interacted sort of, um, sort of situation with the pieces. Um, but the, the, this work was called If I Could, and it was speaking to humility, as well as coming from the song by Simon and Garfunkel that samples the Andean folk song El Candor Pasa. So it's a synthesis of these two cultures, and that's what I'm always interested in evoking with my work uh, for the next slide. Um, so people could enter into the space once they removed their socks and shoes and actually could spend time here on these pieces. And the sculptures were about the size of a seated body to encourage viewers to spend time in the space. And these sculptures are um, modeled after the Paracas mummy bundles. Um, the Paracas were a pre-Columbian civilization from Southern Peru. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Um, so they had this practice of burying the body in um, a natal position to create this idea of leaving and entering the world in the same way, and then placing uh, the body in a basket and then wrapping them completely in textiles, basically creating a womb around um, the piece with textiles that were created throughout the individual's life as well as their death. 
Um, so I wanted to really have these pieces that were honoring this tradition that are made with um, handmade techniques of hand coiling, which is an ancient technique that was uh, traditionally used to create water vessels um, because it created a structure that was so tight, um, as well as sort of these shag pieces and different elements that represented femininity in reference to obviously this community of women, as well as the communities of women that continue to be the artesanias that practice and put so much labor into these pieces. Um, so next slide. And so um, that brings us in contrast to the new work um, that was commissioned for the show. And so um, as I had previously stated, um, installations for me were a, a really dynamic way to engage with the viewer and also work with the relationship that they have with the material. Everyone has a relationship obviously to textiles. And so I wanted to build off of that, um, that sort of dynamic. But after the pandemic, I felt like things needed to be in a, in a much more removed sort of way. And so I had wanted to make something that was um, far removed from the viewer. I think of these as sort of as gargoyles um, and gargoyles traditionally um, were on the exterior, obviously of churches as a way to dispel evil as well as being a symbol of the uncontrollable or change. And so these are these sort of gargoyles in a sense that are also in reference to the tradition of arpilleras, um, but they're adorned really just with stripes. And so um, striped cloth has a very contentious history. Um, there's biblical text that talks about how stripes are an untrustworthy untrust cloth um, because they're made of two. You can't tell which is the foreground or the background. And so I wanted to sort of create these arpilleras with stripes as a way of, um, of talking about the outlier as well as exalting that sort of sense of change. Um, but yeah, but thank you so much. Ask, I wanted to start by asking production if they could share some of Glendale's slides while we start the combo at the beginning so that viewers can at least see some of the some of the work that, Glende, that, that Glendalis uh, spoke about during her presentation. So if we could just um, see her work, that would be great. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, so. Okay, great. Fantastic. So we're, we're all back, right? Okay, so um, let's start this conversation. I wanna just first again reiterate my thanks to, um, to Elizabeth for organizing the event, for thinking that she wanted to highlight my book um, and the issues that I raise in, on it, in it, in relation to the conversation and also to all of the artists that are uh, in the exhibition. That's very generous of Elizabeth. So thank you again for that. Um, so let's go back to, let's try to ignore all the technical difficulties we just had, right? And uh, we are here with cafecitos or with uh, some drink and, you know, we're going to ignore that we have uh, some people out there, right? Um, although I want to encourage everyone to please send your Q&As. Um, I'll ensure that in the next 10 minutes we'll get to them. But my first question, um, I wanted to just put it out there that one of the great things about your work is... Um, the kind of relationship that you have with the viewer, you know, there is a kind of cultural competency that that you almost assume the viewer will have when they engage with the work, right? You're engaging, you know, the way that you treat the Chacana uh, Mary, right? That you know, some viewers that will recognize that that symbol, right? If you know about Andean culture, if that's something that's part of your background, you'll immediately see it. But many people will not. Um, the same with Glendalis or Antaino, or even be, begin to, to notice the, the, the boombox, right? Um, and li likewise with Sarah and her materials and the artisanal uh, materials and, and processes that she alludes to in her work. Um, so I wonder if you could, you know, is, is, I, there's something really powerful, right? 
that I feel you're trying to communicate that basically says, you know, you need to know about this. And if you don't go learn about them or look it up, I'm not going to worry about that because these are really important elements and references that everyone should know about, right? I mean, that's my take on what you're doing, but I wanted to put it out there and, and hear from you, right? Whether you're intentionally um, drawing from these references, right? playing with the audiences and trying to foster different engagements when you do that kind of work. So I don't know who'd like to start. I'll just leave it out there. Um, I, I can start. Um, uh, specifically with the Chacana symbol, um, I think um, Sarah may have seen that symbol because it is a, an Andean symbol. And we see that um, routinely in textile design in um, motifs, we see it in, in um, ancient architecture, but even contemporary, it's like painted on murals. It's everywhere in terms of the Andean or um, anywhere in South America that has been touched by the sort of uh, Incan empire um, vocabulary. So um, for me, it is an opportunity to um, have that conversation in terms of ancient cultures or um, sacred geometry, or the language of um, uh, sacred sciences and sacred geometry that is in, embedded in not just pre-Columbian culture, but pre-colonized culture. It's an Asian culture, it's an African culture, it's in, in many cultures um, that understand and utilize geometry within their everyday life, from textiles that they would wear, the way that they would organize spaces, um, how they built pyramids, all py pyramid structures, it utilized geometry and had an embedded understanding of not just their physical spaces and materials, but they also understood the cosmos and how it related to when we farmed, um, how, when we could navigate the sea. Um, and so I feel like that understanding as well, to me, as well as being born in the States and not having, um, and only speaking to colonial languages. I speak Spanish and, and English, but I don't speak Quechua, which my grandmother spoke. Um, I think it's sort of like, uh, for me, understanding that this is a vernacular on itself, um, that perhaps um, we've lost a direct connection to be, um, because I don't have the Quechua language. And the Quechua language was a, a verbal language. It wasn't a written language originally. so. In terms of translation, there's no way to sort of translate pictorial or um, uh, languages that are based in symbols because they mean different things depending on what they are next to or how you say it. So the intonation, so it can mean so many different things. So um, for me, understanding or trying to reconnect with the power of um, these patterns and, um, and geometry and the symbolism um, that it's charged with, I feel like it's me trying to present it as um, not like Linda Lees would say, um, low art, but the original art of understanding abstraction. <laughs> Absolutely. Linda Lees, you're smiling. I know you wanna to add to this convo. Well, I think I'm very happy that Mary said that. Yes, I think it's the original. <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I see the absence so much in the canon and the way that art is spoken about that I felt that it was necessary not only to engage with my audience, meaning like people from where I come from, people that can understand this language, but also I'm tired of being the one that assimilates. Like it's time for the other people to assimilate to my culture <laughs> and assimilate to my to where I come from and and, um, and the real history of abstraction. Because when I think of abstraction, I'm not thinking of like like um, what's his name Pablo. I'm not thinking of Pablo. You know, I'm thinking of like textiles. I'm thinking of craft work. I'm thinking of weaving. I'm thinking of a lot of other things that have nothing to do with like modernism. So um, yeah, I use it because it, 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 um, it relates to a specific land and it relates to a specific culture and it relates to, yeah, now it's time to, to be on stage. Now it's time to like assert my voice and assert the voices that have been silenced. Mm. 
Absolutely. I completely agree. I think it's about like honoring these traditions that so often were stifled or like that we were made to feel guilty of, especially speaking to craft traditions. And if you're working in craft traditions, you're just an artesania and how you can use these very, not low materials, but accessible materials to create something that is so amazing and so complex. And, you know, I think Absolutely. I go back for the pre-Columbian textiles. Like those are so contemporary. They're so plastic. They're amazing. And so often it's important really to exist in all these different times to exalt and to honor our ancestors and carry them with us in this way. And so I think it's, it's really important to talk about these things and how they continue to be incredibly contemporary. Absolutely. This is exactly why I say Latinx artists are the, the primary decolonial thinkers nowadays. You, the kind of work you're doing is it's really um, it's really at the vanguard of conversations we need to be having. So thank you for that. Um, I love the fact that this is, you know, all women and female identified um, artists, right? And how rare that is, not only in the contemporary art world, but also when we think about, about abstraction, which is not only so white identified, but also so male centered, right? That conversation. Um, and it's so great that here we have a show that is so diverse. And also this panel, right? That brings attention to the perhaps obstacles and added challenges, right? That, that, that not only Latinx artists face in, in being recognized as when they do abstraction, but also the added challenges of women and female identified artists. So can any of you, I'm sure you'll have a lot to say about that. Um, if anybody would like to start, otherwise I will call on Mary. Um, yeah, um, I think it's important that there, that we assert our presence. Um, part of it is because in being present, we are then um, valued. And um, I think that it's something that um, we have to assert, we have to have, um, we have to fight for agency, not just of uh, participating in a system that um, wants to marginalize us, but also sort of taking agency to say, no, actually, when we're talking about our own history or art history, um, I'm part of this history long before modernism started. And I, I think it's um, uh, very honorable to participate in um, the art world as uh, someone who is offering beautiful things, but offering also things that are um, making people question um, their own histories, but probably opening up ideas. Um, and I think that when because I teach, and I know that Mendelis teaches, I'm not sure if Sarah does, but when you're in the academic system, um, it is heavily white male dominated. Um, and when I had the opportunity to, for my undergrad to learn, um, or my, my major was uh, painting, I had white male professors. Um, so it was a challenge to have a conversation um, as to why, um, I wasn't presenting images of uh, black or brown bodies in distress or um, in struggle or uh, with a politically motivated image that would um, sort of um, press on certain people's um, interests. And to me, it was a conscious decision to not use images like that um, I think there are many artists who use images like that that are successful, but for me, um, I felt that it was more useful for um, to present alternate visual um, narratives and, and visual imagery because um, I personally don't want to see a reflection of myself in pain. I know there's other stories, there's other nav narratives, there's um, uh, opportunities to share. Um, the power, strength, and legacy of um, our culture and our knowledge and wisdom and um, our communities without the, um, I guess the uh, trope of, you know, iconic, uh, palatable and re easy to read imagery. 
And that has nothing to do with me not valuing, valuing those images. I love figurative work. I am a huge fan, but um, I specifically choose to not use those images for personal reasons. Um, and yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think you also, you know, it speaks to there's also uh, assumptions around uh, women and female identified uh, artists the expectation that there's, for instance, you know, when I was writing Latinx art, some authors highlighted the expectation of doing work with around the body, right? Or, or, or work that highlighted kind of so-called more feminine or domestic settings, right? Um, which brings back to, to the power, right, of, of the works a lot of you are doing, you know, that speaks to, you know, astronomy or figures or, or that, you know, I, I know Mary, you're being very, uh, that's been part of, you know, as you said, right? You're challenging against that expectation by actually producing work, right? That troubles those expectations of what is, right? Um, uh, work that women or female identified artists would do. Um, but, so thank you for that. Glendalis, you wanna add or Sarah? Um, what I would say about that is like, I'm confronted many, many times on many, many stereotypes about what people might think about what I am. Um, and I've gotten to a point in my life where I am not interested in engaging with that dialogue. Um, I am not here to educate you. I am here to make my work. And that is the only education I am providing. <laughs> um, I am not here to convince you. I am not here to do anything like that. Like that is not my job, that is your job. And so instead of engaging in that dialogue or handling that dialogue or trying to get validation from anybody, I am too busy like doing the work, <laughs> making the work and the work should speak for itself. And the more I make, the more work I make, the, the louder my voice gets. And that's really where I'm focused on, like how loud can I become? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I, I feel similarly to both of you as well. I think for me, it manifested in this way where, oh, I work in textiles that's overly feminine. It's over this, it's performing within the sort of assumption. And I wanted to turn it into something that was much more excessive and almost obnoxious to the point where you could not not see it. And I think that for me, it was just, it's important really to, to blow up really these preconceptions and how we can operate really in whatever we need our work to be. And, um, and really forget how these sort of like limitations that um, can be implemented on that. And so it's, it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things that we know about stereotypes is that, um, that it's not about the stereotype or the image, it's about the systems of power in which- Exactly. And, 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 and as long as the systems of power remain unequal, right? Any representation would be stereotyped, right? So there's no way out. There's no mm -hmm. safe representation. There's no way out of either abstraction is never gonna be more political than figurative, but all, all of this is a futile conversation mm -hmm. as long as you have um, unequal uh, power. So that's all, uh, what, what's great about all the work, uh, the answers that all of you are providing is that you're basically, you know, saying you're empowering yourselves to go outside of that conversation and that vicious circle by actually just doing work and getting the work done and just, just, just leading, leading by example, if you will, and opening doors um, to others by doing the great work all of you are doing. Um, I wanted now to turn to the Q&As. We have a couple of great questions. And before I pick one, I want to ask any of any of you, either Sarah or Glendalise or Mary, if there's one in particular that you really want to answer, just go ahead and go for it. Um, on, on my end, I want to um, maybe pick um, one question from Carrie Torres that asks, um, who is the audience that you're thinking when you're creating the process? I guess that has been answered a little bit because all of you are highlighting that you're coming, you're not really thinking about the outside you're thinking about. So maybe, um, let me see, maybe we'll go to, um, hmm. Yeah, we'll go with Eileen Pagnanelli. Do you believe there is a decentering of the histories of Latinx abstraction happening both in the United States and Latin America? 
do you feel that finally we are diversifying and perhaps this exhibition is part of that conversation? Um, I don't know. I think there's a different motivation and intention depending on if you are uh, born or raised or have to navigate um, your identity in your country of origin versus the United States. So I think it's a, it's kind of like two, there's, there may be multiple answers or intersection, intersecting answers, depending on where you're, where you are physically and your, and your um, lived experience. So I'm not sure, I, I had to think about that, but I don't know if anybody else wants to okay. answer that. But I, that was a really big question. A really big question, that, like Mary said, that I'm not sure how to answer that. That's like trying to answer, you know, answer for the whole of, of a whole country and a whole like body of people. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's decentralized. Um, yeah, that's a really hard question for me to answer. Yeah. Well, why don't you answer the question from um, Julia Justo, which wants to know, Glenda Lee, what is the significance of the colors you use in your artwork? Um, I use black and gold a lot. Uh, the work in the show includes uh, brown and pink and white. And I picked those, you know, me and Mary are kind of similar palette there. <laughs> um, I picked those colors because I, you know, I, I usually I usually use black and gold to relate to the African to my African heritage and to the use of gold and why colonial colonialism even happened. But I also use gold to relate to the sun and to relate to the descriptions of the Taino people as being sun kissed. Um, in this work in brick, I wanted to relate to the body and the fact that pink is in all of us. You know, there, we are white, we are black, we are indigenous, we are everything you can think of. And so for me, the brown relates to the brown body, the black relates to the black body, the white relates to the white body, the pink relates to all bodies, and the gold relates to colonialism or relates to the sun. So that's why I picked my palette. Uh, yeah, that question I could definitely answer. Okay. I want to also, <laughs> also ask the question by Linda Arreola, which can says... I, can I, I'm sorry, Renee, I think I thought about the question. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I want to say that that question can't really be answered because because culture is not fixed. Um, and every country has a different um, origin uh, sto uh, or history, a cultural history and a different colonial history um, and a different history um, of uh, genocide and slavery in Latin America. Um, so I think to try to center all of that is um, very short-sighted. I think that the um, amazing thing about being part of the diaspora is that you can relate to the colonized experience, to the indigenous experience, to the enslaved experience um, in one, one way or the other. And the Spanish, Portuguese, French experience, English experience. So, um, through some way or another. And then if, and we can relate or not relate to migration. My parents moved from, or historically my parents, uh, my ancestors moved from the Andes to the coast because that's where the work was. Um, then they moved from the coast to New York. So, I mean, the, the, there's a investment in migration and the stories and what you sort of keep and embed, are embedded with. So nothing is fixed. So I don't think that there's, there's a fair way to center anything. And I think if anyone tries to just sort of make everything one, it may work for like a good hot minute and then next yeah. month something else will happen and yeah. which will change it, so. I, I wanna turn to the question by Linda Areola because it, it's one that I think any of you could answer and I'm, all of us are very curious, right? The work is so powerful and thank you all for sharing um, I'm sorry, the work is to inspire and enrich with roots deep in the ancient. How did you take your interest in doing the work you do and who influenced or taught you? So would any of you would like to share any, any influences or major figures that 
shape your work? Hmm. Um, or not maybe perhaps not one figure, but trends, right? Or, or context or, you know, um, perhaps a social movement, something in particular that not just, you know, we tend to think of like one person in terms of teachers and mentors, but oftentimes, right? The influences are more diverse and varied than that. I would, I would say that I am, I have influences coming from all different aspects of life whether it be art or philosophy or music or theory, or it just comes from all sorts of places. I think, you know, my work is very different than what it was 10 years ago. Not that different, but a little different, <laughs> you know? And so the influences just keep coming because my interest keeps growing. So the more I become more, um, the more I try to fill myself full of information or research, um, that really just stems from really asserting my voice more. Because, you know, before 2016, I wasn't using Taino imagery. Uh, that really came from someone asking me, you know what, I would really love for you to do a public proposal uh, for the Latin Jazz Festival. And I was like, and this is where that work, this work behind me comes from. And that really stemmed um, from a, a commission, someone asking me to do something specific and that led to research and that led to me uh, thinking about things a little bit differently. And that led to more, you know, it's just like a snowball effect of, re of resources and research. It kind of just stems from life experiences and who you talk to, who you bump into, who asks you to do some. Um, so it comes from all over the place. It comes from grad school too. Like, uh, I'm not gonna say that modernism wasn't influential because I love Walter D. Maria, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna lie about that. Um, I love Agnes Martin too, but I also love like, a book I have on African mass or uh, Latin American art or like Zelia Sanchez. I was really happy to see her at El Museo. So it's like, it comes from all over the place. I mean, I'm really influenced by Nietzsche or Franz Fanon. It's just like all <laughs> over, it comes from all over, all over the place. Sarah, would you like to add? Sure, um, I, I can definitely agree. Um, I feel like life is ultimately very inspiring and everything that you encounter as there's so much intentionality, I feel, and purpose and people that come to you or you go down these rabbit holes. Um, but for me, particularly, um, like I got started in textiles. My, my family is from Piura, which is um, on the Northern coast of Peru. And my grandfather was a textile salesman. And so for me, it was a way even just when I was a kid and I was in Texas and like so unhappy with, with where I was and what my life was, the way that I could change my um, experience was through what I was wearing or painting clothes, painting textiles. And that led obviously to researching them so much deeper and even just figuring, um, <clears throat> figuring out how to weave and learning about rugs and that history and how even they're a sign of colonialism prior to the Spanish coming to Peru. Textiles were not used on the ground in that regard, but they're thought of this incredibly ubiquitous item now from this part of the world and how you know we're dropped in the middle of time and we're just trying to figure out where we fit in that time. And so I think history, everything, everything is inspiring um, and, and purposeful as well. Um, I concur with Glenn and Sarah. I think there's multiple uh, points of reference. And to me, I think it's definitely comes from my uh, parents who were immigrated from Ecuador to Queens, first to the Lower East Side and to Queens. Um, so I think the place that I was in or that I grew up in, um, you know, the onset of, uh, hip, you know, hip hop culture and being in Queens um, but also traveling back and forth to Ecuador growing up. Um, and sort of these, this assertion in our family that um, education was a really big deal and mentorship was very valued. Um, so when I went to undergrad and graduate school, I looked for mentors. Um, I always try to find someone that I felt like that I could relate to. Um, so um, I think there was a big value of in um, not just educating oneself, but also um, sharing what you learned and that that was a super respectable position to be 
a teacher or a professor, but that professors were very valuable. So I, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that I, I, I really feel strongly about teaching and teaching at, at CUNY and being on the commission because I feel like people need to see uh, someone like me present in those spaces. Um, but I, I on, like just Gandalisa said, there's so many references. I mean, I love Octavia Butler. I love um, uh, films that have to do with sci-fi. Like my, one of my favorite movies is Interstellar and I've watched it like over 50 times. Um, I love, uh, you know, Asian and um, a theory of um, uh, abstraction and sacred geometry because a lot of um, a lot of that which uh, my um, mentor, my old mentor Terry Atkins um, put on me was when I was in graduate school was uh, that language that I felt that I was missing um, that was not a Eurocentric or Western European model of describing what I was doing. So I think he sort of sort of uh, pushed me towards reading this a different theory that would explain art and um, uh, the divine and image making in a different way, which I thought was had the language that I needed to sort of explain what I was doing. Um, so yeah, all those things, film, uh, sci-fi, my family, food, being from Queens um, <laughs> and the time. We have a lot of great questions, but I'm gonna pick two here because um, this is from Anonymous. Um, if the artists were curating the exhibition, would they have changed anything or were there other artists that you would have uh, included in a, new, in, a, in a new edition, right? Um, would anybody like to? I'll we'll start with that. I remember going to see the show and after install and telling Elizabeth, this should be like 25 people you know but they, it doesn't fit in brick so it's like yeah there could be multiple amounts of people in the show and it really it could be a, a whole it could fill a whole museum if you think yes. about it it could fill yeah. a whole museum so yeah there's mm -hmm. there could be a lot more people in the show i'm really happy to be a part of the show but there could at least be 25 more people in there and that really is just finding an institution that could hold those people uh, that's interested in that show that really sees the value in it yeah so yes I'm not going to name the 25 people, but yes. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, I, I think that's important, so important because so many of us can think of so many other artists that are working with abstraction. And one of the things that the exhibition does is like, hey, go, go, go find them, right? Yeah, They're go out find there. them. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Um, so Stephanie Link wants to know what's next for each of you professionally and where can they engage with your work? If anybody would like to say, to share that. What's next for you? What next shows or? I, I, I guess I feel like I'm talking a lot though. Um, well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be a part of a show that's happening with Embajada. Uh, so check that out. That's going to be online. Uh, another show that's happening. I'm having a, a couple of group shows that are happening and um, that I can't remember all the names of because sometimes that happens. Uh, but if you want to keep track of my uh, excursions into the art world, uh, you could just follow me at Glendalise Medina on Instagram. And I usually post, um, yeah, and look out for a public artwork this coming soon. Sarah, what's next for you? Um, I'm, well, currently I'm also in another group show at the Latinx Project. That's a really amazing um, show that is called Cruising the Horizon. Um, really honored to be a part of it. Um, and then some group shows, the rest of the year um, and uh, yeah, I'm just kind of doing a reset and figuring out what I'm gonna be doing. So um, I also have Instagram if you wanna follow me and a website. Yes. Um, so I recently was um, awarded the Mellon Arts Fellowship um, through the, let me get the entire name right, it's Center for um, uh, Comprehensive uh, Studies in Race and Ethnicity in Stanford University. So it's a really, really long and very, uh, I guess, overlapping um, CCSD and the Mellon Foundation are funding. But what it does is it's, it's um, um, 
offering artists of uh, either indigenous or African descent that are making work uh, in re relationship to that, to um, a fellowship or almost like a residency, academic residency in different institutions in the nation. So um, I'm doing that till the end of June to mid June. And um, hopefully I will be able to um, have some panel discussions, which I will be reaching out to some of you on this panel about um, to continue a conversation about uh, indigenous yeah. community and um, uh, contemporary art. Yeah. So, and I also have an Instagram uh, profile. It's called, it's the real Mary Valverde. Uh, I know um, Elizabeth wanted to talk about issues of market circulation and reception of the work of Latinx artists and abstract art. So in that spirit, I'm going to pick two questions that kind of allude to that. Um, one is from Camilo Alvarez, who asks, can you speak to tactics you have found successful in gaining access to audiences, specifically the art world, the art industry, uh, of, which of, of which the market and museums are part of? And related to that, a question from Mark27 that wants to know what institutions, museums, galleries in the United States are truly supporting Latinx artists? Where can you find Latinx artists? So. Um, the, as far as like tactics, um, I would say go to organizations in which you wanna be a part of to start relationships with them. Um, you can't expect people to know who you are if you don't introduce yourself. You shouldn't wait around for people to give you opportunities. You should ask for them because no one knows what you want unless you tell them. It's like there's no time to be passive. I know that as women, we are taught to be passive and men are generally more assertive, but there's really no, t if you're a female artist, or a non-binary artist or whatever you consider yourself to be. It's like, there's no time to be passive. You have to be proactive. Another thing I would recommend is that you find a group of people, a community <laughs> that can actually support you in your practice. And so you're not left alone in the art world. And I think as far as institutions that are, are promoting Latinx artists, I, 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 would love that. I would love to have a list of that actually, <laughs> you know? I, I, I would love if someone else could give me that answer because I, I'm not really sure there are a lot of them. I, I think that most curators are not Latinx curators and, and even the Latinx curators are, are forced to support only Latinx artists and they have other interests, just like I have other interests. So it's like, that's a really hard question because I do not have the answer. And if I had the answer, believe me, I would be showing there because I am very proactive. So I, I don't have the answer for that question. I think the answer is to keep asking that question so people can understand that that question needs to be answered. Bravo. Um, mm -hmm. Mary, do you want to add? Um, sure, I, I concur with um, the release. I think that it's really difficult to be part of a system that supports mostly um, a very specific um, definition of what it means to be a uh, contemporary artist, but even smaller uh, women artists and even smaller Latin artists and even smaller abstract Latin artists. So, you know, I would say just keep making your work, be very thoughtful, do your research about your work specifically and how it connects to who you are and how do you want to be pre uh, present, how do you want to present yourself? Um, I found, uh, fortunately, I, um, I mean, I grew up in New York um, and I had really great mentors and, um, you know, the community changes, uh, fortunately and, and unfortunately um, due to just life. So um, sometimes you will have a large community and sometimes you have a small community, but um, your core people, the people who understand your work from the beginning and how you've developed your understanding of yourself and your practice, I think that um, eventually, uh, even if it's sometimes sadly not the people, your peers that respond to your work because maybe they feel like they're too familiar with you and they don't, you know, they, they still see you how they saw you 20 years ago. Um, you know, sometimes it's other either um, mentor age or people that you teach who are your students who really appreciate the sort of um, the overall uh, process and, and practice that you've had. So I think sometimes it depends on the year 
and the institution because um, I had a great relationship with El Museo del Barrio in the early 2000s. And now I can't, I, I haven't heard from them. So, you know, it just depends on who the director is or who is the curator. And it's unfortunately um, very, in a very incestual um, system of uh, just like any system of uh, who is your friends and who they, you know, whose career wants to be propped up, which is an unfortunate thing. But I can only say it, um, what I can say is just keep doing your work be thoughtful about your work. And uh, sometimes if that means applying for things outside of the state that you're living in or outside um, in different institutions, maybe that's where you'll get it or through the academic system. Um, you can, as long as you can uh, feel uh, good about what you're doing and that you're not compromising yourself and doing something that you just wanna do because you wanna make money off of it, then you're good. Mm. I completely want to edify what you both just said. I think it's it's about finding your community and finding that agency and authenticity and what you want to make work about and always staying true to that and making your own opportunities when necessary, always sending in applications. I think grants, I'm always working on grant applications. I think that is a really powerful thing to also crystallize what you are doing with your work in terms of it's never wasted work. Even if you have, you get rejected, you still have a lot of writing that helps you moving forward within your practice. It's just, it's always investing in yourself. Yeah. I want to also for those uh, for the question about where to find Latinx spaces, art spaces, uh, and make a plug for for my for my book because not, don't read the book but read the read the appendixes because what I did in the appendixes is not only create a, a list a non comprehensive list of artists everyone should know about kind of like you know just just learn more about them but also of resources that includes everything from Instagram archivists to actual institutions so that people can begin to find those spaces. And oftentimes there are community organizations. Um, I also wanna give a, a shout out to the US Latinx Art Forum, which is a very important resource and organization. You will find them online, in Instagram, on the web. They have a great website and it's a great resource exactly to fill the void. But, um, You're freezing up. Latinx art. And also, of course, I have Shadow of the Latinx Project, which just opened up our curatorial and artist in rest. Oh, we can't hear you, Arlene. She's stuck. Okay, while Arlene is stuck, I would say that people on the chat are actually giving responses to the questions that people asked about the institutions that are geared to Latinx people. And I will also say that someone asked me to relate the title of the book and the book that I was talking about, I actually put in the chat room while Thank Arlene you. is on pause. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm gonna text her to tell her she's on a pause because she's pretty frozen. She's gone oh. now. We have no moderator now. <laughs> okay, I'm sure Elizabeth will. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I texted Arlene, so hopefully she will uh, will come back. And um, so uh, let's give Arlene a minute, but does anybody else uh, want to uh, comment about the question or add any other um, uh, comments? Uh, can you take another question? Marcela Guillero is, you, sure. did you ask uh, a question, Marcela? Because- Okay, let me, I'll, I'll read it. So this is uh, 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 from Marcela to uh, Sarah to speak more about the sense of scale and arrangement in your work. I'm thinking of the varying ways you make room-wide installations, but also smaller standalone works and how you position the work in different ways. For example, in our show, uh, High on the Wall. Mm. Um, well, in specific to the work that's high on the wall, that was um, a little bit what I was speaking of, but I felt for right now, I really want to be removed from the viewer while still working an installation um, 
And installation, I feel like is a really sort of powerful way to work where the viewer is able to actually be a part of the work and be engaged within it. Um, but usually when I'm creating a new work, it's always steeped in research and then the construction is decided and everything is comprised of a lot of different pieces um, that then separate and then never um, get displayed in the same way again. So then the work sort of has its own existence in different sort of manifestations. Similarly, how I showed the original installation and then how the sculptures exist now. Thanks. So Arlene is back. Um, yeah, I just, can you hear me? I just, I just wanted to highlight the US Latinx Art Forum as a great resource for everyone to learn and also the curatorial calls that we just opened in the Latinx uh, project. It is through those calls that we have Marisa del Toro, a Latinx uh, curator, doing this wonderful exhibition right now that Sara is part of. And the, the call just opened up uh, this, uh, it will be opening up, actually it just opened up this week. So please uh, send us your proposals. Um, but yes, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, sorry about the technical difficulties. But Elizabeth, I think we said, I, I said, I think you said you wanted to wrap up around now. So should I maybe turn to our speakers for last minutes, um, last minute comments from each of them, like, like just closing remarks from each of them. That would be uh, starting with um, Glendalis. You want to start closing remarks? Closing remarks. Um, I can tell you things that I have learned in my life. Um, when you knock on a door and it doesn't open, knock on a bigger door, not a smaller door. A lot of times we are told that we are smaller than what we are, but really we just need a bigger door. Um, a second thing I would recommend is uh, if, you're, if you're knocking on the door in the private sector, like for me, I noticed, you know, I'm not, I've knocked on private sector doors, meaning I have knocked on gallery doors, gallery doors have been open, they come and knock on my door. But what I'm realizing as I got older is that sometimes, you're supposed to be in the public sector. Sometimes your, 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 your work is really made to be to a wider audience and it's not made to be collected and put in someone's house. So you really have to think, you have to think really broadly and, and, uh, and just open your perspective a little bit because if you, keep, um, if you keep hitting the wall, then maybe you should jump it. That's, that's, that's my advice. <laughs> That's my last words. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to, um, I guess my last words would be similar to what Gandhi said, um, that um, there is no one avenue for success. Um, as long as you are making the work all the time that you feel uh, compelled to make and you, are, you make due diligence with your own personal research and what you really want to to learn about in terms of material or just concept or whatever, and you keep creating, um, your work will always get better. You'll always, the process will always be uh, something that you feel um, intrinsically and that will make you feel whole. So when you're happy in making the work and you know that it's something that is worthwhile in terms of thought and research and concepts, or just like your own, um, lived experience, your, your work is gonna, it's gonna be shown in the work. Um, and uh, I agree, uh, sometimes your work is not meant to be permanent. Sometimes it's meant to be in, in uh, museum spaces where they're not necessarily trying to sell your work, um, like, in, like in a gallery space where it's like, they're worried about whether there's a nail through the paper or something like that. You know, it's, you know, it just depends on what, where in your career or where in your life um, that, that process is. And um, also don't be afraid to be by yourself and to mm -hmm. be the only person that believes in yourself. Um, and, you know, not everybody is your friend in the art world. So just, you know, just be thoughtful of, about where you spend your time and how you offer your time to different spaces. Make sure that there are people who respect you as an artist and that respects your process and value what you're offering the space. Love both of those sentiments, like very wonderful. Um, and I'll keep it short, but I think um, something that is just really, um, I think about a lot, I'm a Capricorn, but it's very much um, intentionality. And I think that that 
sort of honoring and respect of intentionality and respect for yourself, respect for your experience and how that manifests, I think is very powerful. So thank you. Can I say one more thing? I just want to <laughs> Absolutely. I would say like, if you want to get to a place, you write them, you write them, you, you look at the map, right? So don't expect to get to your goal unless you write your goals down. It's just, mm. it's just not going to happen. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, I want to thank everyone. I know there's so many great artists, curators, cultural activists, and supporters in the audience. And it's really too bad that we could not be together, but virtually I want to communicate that we see you, we recognize, we can see the list of attendees and we send lots of appreciation and also Thank you, Elizabeth, again, for always fighting for Latinx artists and creating spaces and also for doing so with such intellectual rigor, because it is so important to not only create shows, but to research about the artists, write about them. And that's exactly what you've done, not only with this exhibition, but also with your important book that just came out. Everyone should go and read Latinx photography and, and learn about the history. This is not a fad. This is not new. This has been going on forever. And there's no excuse not to learn about the history of Latinx art, abstraction, and all. And with that, I will just say uh, thanks to everyone. And I will pass it on to production that will do the closing I'm gonna, remarks. I just want to uh, close with a few words. Uh, Arlena, yes. I also want to thank you very much. This has been wonderful. And thank Linda Lise and Mary and Sarah. I've you know spoken to you all multiple times over the course of the year. And developing the exhibition, but every time we talk, I learn more from you. So thank you just so much for your creativity and wisdom. Uh, the exhibition is on view at Brick House uh, through May 1st, um, Wednesday through Saturdays, you can just drop in and see the show. I, but if you come on the weekend, I especially suggest that you make a, uh, a reservation on Brick's website. Uh, we also are now offering uh, private exhibition tours on Zoom. So if you go to the education link on Brick's website, you can sign up for a tour with one of our docents. We're excited to be uh, giving that uh, virtual experience. And we have one more program with the sculptor Alejandro Guzman, who's part of the exhibition. He's gonna be doing a private performance in the space and that will be uh, shown on Brick's YouTube channel, uh, April 28th at 7 p.m. So we look forward to uh, seeing you in our space seeing you virtually. And as Arlene said, we wish we could all be with you in person, but I know that there were people from different parts of the country in our audience. <laughs> so that was really exciting too, to have such a, such a wonderful uh, group of people in the audience. And we thank you for being here and we thank you for all your uh, questions and comments. They, they really invigorate all our work. So with that, I'll say good night. Thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. Bye-bye. <laughs>